Interesting. Interesting. So now I've got two chats going at one time, so this should be interesting. Very, very fun. <laughs> uh, your video title says this is building a NOAA satellite dipole. Okay. Hold on. Let me... Uh... Let's try again here. Okay, so Keeping Ham Radio Relevant should be active right now, so you should be able to see it, which is what I'm seeing over there. That's good. And we're going to have to resync the chat really quick. So I'm going to stop the other one. That's one way of doing it. Apologize for the people watching on the other stream. Go back to the other one. I apologize. It's going to have to switch over. Uh, your video title says building Noah Dipole. Yeah, that's incorrect. Um, all right, we're flipping over. So sorry about that. Go to the other link. Okay, so hopefully that should sort them out. So the people that are not are watching the Noah satellite one, it, it's going to cut right now and then hop over, and you should be good. <laughs> God. That's my fault, doing too many things. I believe last week uh, set that all on the wrong foot anyway we should get this sorted out right now uh there it is all right maybe it all synced up now should be good okay very good all right thank you about thank you for uh <laughs> sticking with me through that we got through that in less than 10 minutes which was good and we got through the news so um anyway if you're if you're watching me now i'd appreciate it give me a thumbs up <laughs> that would be great <laughs> all right uh now only two how is there only two it shouldn't only be one. I killed it. I killed it. Anyway, we're going to keep going. All right. So we're going to do kind of a check on the state of the hobby. And how I'm doing that is I'm using Dustin N8RMA's survey that he held. He's been holding this for a couple of years now. I know I took the 2018 survey and the 2019 survey. And the links for Dustin's blog are in the description for this video. So if you're interested, go check that out. So what we're going to do is we're going to show some of his uh, diagrams. I'm going to talk through them a little bit. And then I'm going to give you kind of what my thoughts are on on basic facts from this survey basically that he held so thanks again dustin on doing this because i know it is a tremendous amount of work um so we should really thank him for doing what he does because it's it's pretty awesome and this is a very useful tool so anyway so the average age of amateur radio operators, this is kind of the step chart for that. So from 14 and under, um, all the way up to 65 and over. Samuel Ridley, thank you very much. I appreciate I appreciate the, the super chat. Thank you. And, and thanks for sticking with me, all of you guys, as we got this sorted out. But anyway, okay, so the average age, big note, big things jump out at me here. Obviously, it's kind of like a gradual step up until 45, 55, and then it, it plateaus up as you get to 55 and then 65 and older. So that is a very interesting bullet point that we'll, we'll talk to that in a little bit. Uh, question was, do you belong to at least one local club? And the majority, 64% said yes. I find that very good news. Very good news. I, I thought I thought that was way higher than it would be, to be honest, because I bump into a lot of people that aren't in clubs. A lot of people I meet you know, when I go to HRO or, or wherever I'm at that are hams, a lot of them are not in clubs. So maybe I, I have some thoughts there that we'll talk about on that. And then I enjoy attending local club meetings. And this kind of also there was a question related to going to ham fest. And yeah, strongly agree. Generally, everybody enjoys going to local club radio meetings, stuff like that. That's all makes sense. I hope, you know, laying the, we're laying the foundation for the, the topic of discussion here. So here's the big one, and this is a this is a spicy meatball of, of information. Uh, the issues facing our hobby, and really there's two that leap out to me. Obviously, operator base aging out is the big one, and you see it, it's broken up into two bars. There's the issue, like an actual issue, and then largest perceived issue. So if it's both high in the blue and high in the orange, that's a key indicator that you should probably think about that as being a problem going forward. So, operator age, um, operator base age, <laughs> operator base aging out. There we go. Uh, meeting people are, are getting older, and for whatever reason, they may hang up the microphone or, or hang up the key. 
Uh, but that's a real thing. And, and if we go back, right, if we go back to this one, 55 and older being the majority of amateur radio operators, it's an interesting note. And then, so I, I, the HOAs, yes, that's a big problem. I agree. RFI from external sources. Uh, that is a problem. There are ways to work around that, but I know a lot of hams aren't really willing to do that or, or you know, they have, they have problems with doing that. And I understand um, power company being a big one. Uh, man, okay, good. Everybody's on the same chat now, so we got to sort it out. Thank you very much for sticking with me on that. Thank you. Uh, poor our, uh, poor on-air etiquette. That's a high one. Poor solar cycle. So we can't help that. That We can't fix that one today. I, I, I'm not going to try and ten, uh, have a discussion on that particular <laughs> topic because it's a little bit out of my control. And then general lack of interest. I, I took that as a, a, a big key indicator because you've got – You've got large blue lines, and then you've got that orange largest perceived issue. So between operator base aging out and lack of general lack of interest, I found those to be like the key jump out at me and say, "Wow, okay, we, we've got a problem here, and these are kind of uh, these are kind of the issues we should probably look at." So, were you encouraged to participate in the hobby from an Elmer, an Elmer, or mentor? And 71% said no. I find I found that pretty interesting as well. That, that was surprising. I thought it would be much, much higher than that. So, again, interesting takeaway. And any members of your family radio amateurs? 86% no. Hmm, okay. Well, let's, let's kind of talk about some breaking these down. Uh, and then, of course, my favorite. <laughs> I believe technician class license should be granted additional HF privileges. And generally trends to no. Which, I think you know my thoughts on this, but we will leave it at that. All right, so here's a, I like this. I threw this in there because uh, Dustin sent it to me, and I really like the, uh, these word clouds are kind of like the things that come up the most. Uh, in the survey or the answers to the survey when people commented, made their own personal comments. These were some of the largest ones. And SWL, shortwave listening, way larger than I expected. Listening, what a huge word. Uh, <laughs> those are important. We should do more of that. We should always be doing that. So what are my key takeaways from all of this? And uh, they are as follows. So over 65% of the licensed hams are 55 years old or older. 65% of our, of our population of radio amateurs um, are of 55 and older, which is a pretty high number. It's obviously a more aged hobby. Uh, I have thoughts on that. I think that some of the radios, particularly when you get to, uh, when you get to HF, are pretty expensive. And a lot of people just maybe don't want to spend the money um, on something that expensive. I think things are changing and trending downward a bit. But um, no, no, that's not what I want. Go ahead and mute that too. But still, it's more of an expensive hobby. Now, I will say uh, that amateur radio is like just about any hobby. When you start to get to the higher end of any hobby, it starts to get really expensive. Adult hobbies generally do that. So I don't think that we're generally in the minority in amateur radio at the same. Well, you can ask Bob K6 GDA he used to race cars. I bet that's a way more expensive hobby, but there are ways to do it in, in, in a compromise sense. Everything's a compromise in amateur radio that you can get a radio on the air without spending a ton of money. So anyway, I, I think that's important, but you know, I did a I did a video on building a shack, a one thousand dollar shack, and I went through multiple different aspects of the hobby um, for setting up a shack for about a thousand dollars, and that includes the HF radio, the antenna, you know, the whole nine yards of what you need, and and often most of them also had a VHF UHF component too. So keep that in mind. If you haven't watched that, that would be good to go check out at a later time. The majority, seventy one percent. Uh, report not having a mentor to encourage them to become licensed. That was very interesting to me. I thought that was, uh, as I mentioned, a, a real standout item on the survey. So, you know, how would we change that? How would we affect that? So keep this in your mind. I'm, I'm posing these questions and think to yourself, how do we, 
How do we improve that? What could we personally, individually do? And some of this is going to be pushed on you guys a little bit too. Um, I'm throwing this back on your laps a little bit. Of course, I'm still going to be out here doing what I do, but you know, it's going to be a group effort, right? If we want to increase the numbers of amateur radio, because what does that mean? It means more people to make contacts with, right? More fun in the hobby, which is good. So my two largest issues in amateur radio are operators uh, aging out and the general lack of interest, right? Those two things. And general lack of interest can be kind of a nebulous idea. I took that as they get licensed and then they kind of just peter off. There, there's a number out there. The ARRL has this number. There's a number out there of people who get licensed and never key up the radio. They never talk on it. They never do anything. And I found that I found that so intriguing. So how do we fix that? You know, what, what could we do? People love attending club meets and ham fests. Yes, no question. Uh, if you have not, now again, I, I always say this when we talk about clubs, you owe it to yourself to try a couple. If you go to one and you don't like it, don't panic. There's got to be more. Um, but please, go to club meetings and enjoy what, uh, what you see out there, or try to at least. <laughs> Um, most hams are against opening up some HF to technicians. That's just a, uh, that's where we're at. I, I don't know that I can change that. I've made my points on it. I have thoughts. And then the major interest areas are, uh, DXing digital modes was, was really high in 2019, uh, for interest in, in, you know, new interest or what people like to do. And then antenna design and construction. So I was like, okay, really, really cool points of information there. How do we how do we use that? So my takeaways, a top heavy knowledge base will age out. It is going to age out. Um, baby boomers are getting older. Baby boomers are huge in so many areas of business, not even amateur radio. But there is a whole segment of the workforce that is going to be retiring between now and 2025 and 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 later. And they are taking with it a massive amount of individual knowledge. So I am really worried about that. And we will talk about that. Uh, those inclined to mentor will be doing less of it as people age out. The people that already are mentoring at some point, they're going to not be mentoring anymore. That worries me, right? We need more mentors. Clubs are a major enjoyment factor, which we, we've already covered in the survey. But with the aging skill base, clubs are in threat of aging out themselves. Unless people step up to take up the mantle and the responsibility of that, they're going to start aging out as well. Most hams were not encouraged by mentors to get involved. So something else led them to find the hobby, to motivate them, and become licensed. What was it? You know, I, I would. I, I'm watching the chat right now. Post in the chat what motivated you to find it. What was that, you know, you're walking down the road and you trip on a rock. What was that trip on a rock that was ham radio? I'd love to know, and, I, and I'm going to take notes. I'm going to watch this, but I'll keep going and I'll keep looking up. So, yeah, when you, when you say your grandpa, I mean, that's your mentor. I mean, not mentor. If you didn't, if you weren't mentored, how did you find it? That's my curiosity. I want to do more of that. I want to get people tripping over the ham radio rock. And, and hey, Dan's in the house. Dan uh, was the one who helped out or, or got me in, involved in doing the hack chat. It was a lot of fun. And again, the transcripts are in the link in the description, so you can check that out. Uh, they're pretty cool. They're talks they do a Wednesday at noon, and hack a day has information on the next one's coming up. Uh, let's see. Getting a Jeep. Preparedness. Those are some of the things. Uh, hurricane season in Georgia. Prepping has generated many new hams. I think you're right on that. A chance to tinker with things. Ham radio is a part of my hobby and survival tool. I like that. For me, it was not trusting the cell phone network in the event of emergency. That was Soldier Lund. Uh, a Bunk says weather emergency. Chris Ebert, prepping got me started. Wow, a lot of preparedness. All right. Well, I've got preparedness videos coming up, and I'm actually doing a collab with a preparedness channel here in a couple of weeks. So that's going to be fun. Um, let's see. Licensing to a local net. Oh, listening to a local net. Good. Watching my videos. That's a good, that's a perfect answer. Checks in the mail. Thank you. I found a Now You're Talking book at Radio Shack. That's cool, too. 
It should be taught in schools again. CDN, SHTF. That's not a bad idea. I just don't know that I want to pay for it. Who thinks the government would do a good job at training people on amateur radio? I don't know. Uh, okay. Wow, it's a long list. Okay, I will, I'll keep looking up occasionally if you guys want to. Again, the rock concept is not Dwayne Johnson, but when what was it you're on the internet or you're you're out and about and you you tripped over ham radio somehow and it, and it and you're like oh what's that and someone explained it or you read something or you picked something up and you saw it or you saw a video that that's how i'm interested to know how you stumbled on it so um and then lastly the majority of hams want to keep a barrier between newcomers and hf I, barrier doesn't mean good or bad it just means what it is the state of the uh, the hobby as it is right now and the Generals and extras generally, and some technicians, don't want to give uh, technicians HF access. I get it. I don't agree, but I get it. All right, so flipping it over. How do we keep ham radio relevant? And these are some of my thoughts. Again, some of these were driven off of comments from the hack chat. Uh, so they're going to be added here, and we will talk about them. So I was asked to co-host Hack Chat. It is an hour-long Q&A, like I said, texting on keeping ham radio relevant and that's the link the link is also in the description so you guys can check it out first video i saw were your mcom videos uh been with you ever since rob k8 bcr right on rob thank you very much so elmers dan uh on the hack chat said speaking of elmers and in, in my humble opinion elmering is going to be number one for keeping ham radio relevant uh, so i think dan's right on it and the survey backs that up um I, I believe the face of Elmering has changed. We still have all the traditional Elmers that exist, that are important, and largely have a, a huge knowledge base. They've been doing it longer. They have more experience. They know more. I want to see more of those individuals, everyone really, that's doing something with amateur radio. And really, I'm putting this slide up front. We got a lot more, but this one up front is my big, my big thing. Post your experiences with amateur radio. Start posting them online. Make videos. Make Twitter posts. Make Instagram stories on what you're doing in amateur radio. For the older people that, that don't really want to do video, post more blogs. Post more on QRZ forums. Post more everywhere you can. Of course, try to be welcoming and inclusive when you do it. But there's so much we learn and get interest from by having someone explain what they're doing within amateur radio. It is huge in building that interest when you show people, hey, this is what I'm doing. Why, you know, um, Mike, he, his videos that he does for Parks on the Air are great. And they build a lot of interest because it's showing people, hey, this is what I'm doing. I'm, this is my whole method of my madness. And uh, K8MRD, I was thinking about that while talking. K8MRD Radio Stuff, who's on YouTube, um, he has really nicely done videos that are explained really well and shows the fun he's having with radio, and, he, and the energy comes off of him. So we just need to do more of that, right? Just do more things where you are, if you, again, you got a phone in your pocket, your phone is a great video recording source if you want to do that. You could make a podcast even. You could just post on QRZ forums. And believe me, believe me, the legacy of this information is important because it's called evergreen content. Parks on the Air, the way we're doing Parks on the Air, is going to be relatively the same for years to come. Mike's videos, for example, when he posts a video showing what he's doing with a vertical antenna, that vertical antenna is going to work just as good 10 years from now as it does today. There may be different radios, but a lot of the concepts are going to be the same. So that knowledge, that understanding is something we need to kind of capture. And people really like video. Video is obviously the format I like to work off of. So I really recommend if anyone is interested in doing it, send me a message if you want some tips. Um, but generally, please start capturing it. And it, like I said, it could just be on QRZ or some forum, you know, whatever. And it, it was very important. <laughs> it's very important. Uh, there is a zero advertising for ham on TV and radio. Shred918. I don't... That's not true, man. How is it that uh, that all those ads are on uh, the ARRL's QST magazine? You think those got put there for free? Don't think so. Uh, we set up a soda beams here today with 891 and people came to check it out. Right on! That's Zach. So Zach's in the chat. Appreciate the picture you sent, Zach. All right, 
So attracting youth, Scott said, I know some are concerned that amateur radio isn't attracting a lot of youth. Are there some other events that are youth focused other than scouting? And so I linked some. I, I should put this in the description. I apologize. Sterling sent me these over. Um, the Yoda Americas R2, Yoda R1, and Yoda R3 are the big deals uh, for events. Now, I will, I will do this. I'll say what I've done in the past. I've gone and done talks at a boys and girls club. I've done talks with um, schools. The biggest thing I try to do when I'm talking about radio, I do have slides. I have very few slides. I have lots of demonstrations. I have. I always bring an SDR. I always try to incorporate current technology in some way. In this case, I used a cell phone picture I sent over SSTV via RF, via radio, and explained how you might need to do that if, you know, whatever, if the power was out, practical ex sense, and explain what it was doing. Try to get more into the weeds of using a demonstration to explain the technology, explain the science behind a lot of that stuff. So if you're ever in a situation where you've got a lot of kids watching you, make it real. Put the SDR up on the screen. Show them that waterfall. If you have an ability to have a buddy, you know, walk away, you know, some amount of distance and you show them how a tape measure Yagi works, that kind of stuff with a radio. I'm a, I'm a big proponent of, of doing things by doing them. Uh, don't say you're going to do things and talk about it, but, but actually go and do it. So convey by demonstration as much as you can. So I'm a, I'm a big proponent of that. So this one's a bit uh, an interesting. So Sterling posted this. However, a lot of people have turned off even at the word Elmer in favor of mentor. Times have changed. I, I, I'll, I'll be the one to throw that out there. Obviously, we still have, you know, the large portion, the majority of amateur radio operators are a bit older. However, there are a lot more younger people. And Elmer is kind of a, a, a term that's not in favor, really. More people use the term mentoring. Now, that's just an example but there are other things in our hobby, some vernaculars we use, that may not really be that um, apropos to younger people. So all I'm saying here is don't, you don't have to change your language, but possibly don't get upset if they don't like the word. <laughs> if they don't like the word, it's fine. Don't get mad at them. Don't, don't not help them. Don't not be interested in what they're doing because they don't like one particular thing. As is always the case we always have way more in common than we don't have in common. And if we find just that little few things that don't really, I don't know, that that we disagree on and we use that to alienate someone or use that to not to speak to them, we're going to miss out on a good opportunity, either a knowledge transfer type opportunity or just showing someone new interesting things in radio that you know they didn't know before. So Keep that in mind. I don't know. Keep it in the back of your head. I don't really worry about it. I like the term Elmering. Um, okay. I prefer the term mentoring. I think it's applicable to everything across the community in, in business, in wherever. Uh, I use that more than I use Elmering. But I'm not offended when people use it. So here's this one, man. So this is this is one we, we should talk. And I'm, I'm watching the, the chats as you guys, as I walk through this. I'm going to be looking up at the chat if you got thoughts, because I'm taking your thoughts. I, I mean that. For communication, it's hard to compete with cell phones. Youth are always texting nowadays. Is there a ham alternative that would have any advantage? So I believe if our competition is phones, if we are, if we have to compete against phones, we're doomed. We're, we're doomed. There's nothing we can do about that. We can't make a hold this thing up. It's, it's really simple. There you go. You're talking to your friend. No, we don't want that either. We want people to learn the science behind amateur, but behind radio. We want people to understand how radios work. We want people to want to learn that. So we shouldn't try to necessarily bring amateur radio down to the lowest common denominator. We don't want to do that. We still want there to be to be a hobby and a service in the sense that we are trying to get better ourselves by learning radio technologies and radio science. So yeah, I, I generally think that we should push for understanding on what's going on instead of favoring this whole phone problem. So let's see what, what's in the chat. I'm reading some of your comments. 
Field day has turned into a contest. My personal experience at 43, it was ham hating sea beers. That's true, too. That's still a thing. Yeah. No, I think you guys are... Um, so show show them Echo Link, Zello, and Peanut. I'm not saying uh, that there isn't crossover in amateur radio. That's not what I mean. I'm saying how if you gave somebody Echo Link, so let's say you had a technician fresh fresh out, got their license. Here's your Echo Link. They're gonna play around with it, but I don't know if it's really gonna breed the the interest. It will for some. So hear me out. I'm saying generally the majority or, or a good percentage. Um, so I don't know. I, I'm, I'm looking for those big things that, that will bring people in and become interested in amateur radio, but not have it be, we're just competing with phones or we're trying to interoperate with phones. That's kind of what I'm looking for. <clears throat> Didn't make the cut for the big event uh, the other day. So I went texting images and crossband VHF or better HF coverage. Oh, interesting. James Hannibal, that's a really good idea. I wish Yesu, Kenwood, and Icon would make an SDRHT that could be fully controlled via Bluetooth to a smartphone, but also had its own interface still. That would be a high-dollar radio, but yes, that would be awesome. And maybe that'll change in the future as everything's kind of moving to SDRs. Um, texting goes to people you know. We need... We meet new people every day that's true that's a really good point too listening on the repeater i found in my area technician boycott the big three until they have reasonable that's not the answer that's not the answer i don't under so i i travis i i should god I'll, I'll i'll try and reach out to some of the big three and see if they'd actually want to be on the show but i think there's a really strong misunderstanding on uh the cost to actually bring a lot of these radios to market versus the price that they're charging. I think everybody has a, an opinion that they're just fleecing everybody. And, and I know that's not true. I know it's not true. Yeah, so Anthony Becerra says, lack of Elmer's locally was both good and bad. Dave Kassler's videos are super great. So that's the changing Elmer environment. I know I'm going back a couple of slides, but that's the changing Elmer environment. When, when you have a lack of... It's kind of like arbitrage, believe it or not. Interesting. I never really thought of it like that, but that's what it is. Um, so when you have a lack of a product in a certain demographic in your local area, you will go to other avenues to get that product that you demand. It's the concept of arbitrage. So basically, uh, because we couldn't find local mentors, you went online to find local mentors. That is what people do. That is how de, uh, supply and demand works. So that's a great point. And yeah, that, that is how the, the face of amateur radio mentoring and Elmering is changing. So definitely. Um, all right. So see, this one this one's tricky for me because I am kind of in the same boat as you guys are. What do we do with phones? How do we get those kids off of the phones? The reality is, is I believe there's a lot of kids that find interest in technological stuff. They're tinkerers. They're the quote-unquote hacker type kids like I was. I'd take things apart, put it back together just to see what was inside kind of thing. Those are the kids that would become amateur radio operators. I don't really think that they will be a hard sell into becoming amateur radio operators. It's the other kids. Like, well, do we even bother with the other kids or should we just stay in our wheelhouse and say, no, those are the kids I want. The kids that are going to find us are the ones we want. Um, otherwise, it's kind of a difficult road to hoe. Are you going to go, we're, we're going we're gonna to show people how SSTV works and we're going to get them interested in that. Eh, you'll get some, maybe. Um, I, like, I like the ability to say that amateur radio is a such a wide interest-based hobby that you can be working a satellite one day and then you could be doing you know, SSTV with a friend. You could be talking on a repeater. You could be doing direction finding. All those things you can do with your technician license. So I like to push that stuff. Uh, W3EQB, seek out the nerds. Yes, that is also a 
That is a good point. Yeah, I would have been uh, I would have been a amateur radio operator earlier had someone done a better job of explaining it to me. When I was in Boy Scouts, my introduction to it was pretty was okay, um, and it was on the VHF UHF level, and that person was just talking on repeaters, and so I I didn't have any interest in it. Even back then, I was like, well, I'll just use my phone because <laughs> I had a phone. But nerd stigma. Uh, Brad says, I love the hobby and the people, but nerd stigma is a thing. I know if you are a ham, let's talk. Otherwise, I'm not going to bring it up. I think it impacts younger. Oh, so Brad, that's a personal decision. Um, I talk about amateur radio constantly to people that aren't even, that I don't think would have any interest in amateur radio. I, I just talk about it all the time. If it comes up at work, I talk about it. I'm, I, I don't know. Maybe I'm on the spectrum in that sense. I always think about how I can turn a conversation into amateur radio. <laughs> I, I have always done stuff like that. When I'm really passionate about something, I'll try and turn the whole conversation to it um, to make it about that. <laughs> yeah, well. Okay, let's see. Next slide. I like the title phones, though. That was kind of my – I was into that technicians unleashed so this this goes i, I kind of teased this out a little bit i forgot this slide was coming up um repeater so i was in the same boat a lot of you might have been in the same boat i was like wow i'm on this repeater i'm talking to people this is a thing this is fun i've got people that i want to talk to okay great but they weren't the people that were like the most important in my life Plus, I am of the, uh, the, the, the person that if you are texting me, uh, that's how I want to communicate. If you're calling me, what are you even doing? I try not to call people, which is funny. I talk on radio more than I talk on my cell phone, just to give people an understanding. Uh, so I don't know. I found that repeaters kind of have a, uh, an interest drop-off factor. And you can kind of only keep that up with your um things like mcom you know nets are great those will keep people engaged but you're still going to have this drop off so that's why you know again this is for all of you watching if you if you find yourself in the situation if you just got your technician and you're like yeah i'm on this repeater there's one in my city the owner's kind of a jerk and all he wants to talk to is his friends and they say it's an emergency preparedness repeater, but they don't really do anything for emergency preparedness. So if you find yourself in that situation, consider <laughs> consider learning about APRS. Satellites would be a really good uh, thing to think to look into because then you're talking across the state, across multiple states, talking to people. Of course, you only got like nine minutes to do so. But it's a super fun thing because you've got to build your own antenna. You've got to have your equipment dialed away, squared away, set up correctly. And you'll have a lot more fun or a, a different kind of fun. Sitting in your car or sitting at home on a repeater and talking is fun. It is a different kind of fun than the very fast-paced fun that is satellite contacts. So APRS, great fun for you hikers and outdoors persons. Satellites, really good. Uh, and again, this is all things that if you're talking to a young person, I would focus more on this kind of stuff. I'd say, hey, there's APRS. Hey, there's satellites. You got an amateur radio on a satellite. The STEM, I work with a lot of young engineers. And the STEM community involved in aerospace and space stuff, small satellites, all that, they are immensely interested if you talk about communicating with or being involved with satellites, things in space in general. So that's always something I mention a lot. Uh, packet radio, still a thing. Uh, packet radio is kind of the forebearer of APRS, which still exists in its in its original forms, which we'll have a video out on that hopefully here soon. Um, so yeah, all of the above. And all of the above doesn't require a lot of money out of pocket, I should say that. To work satellites, the most you need is a uh, basically two baofengs to do it kind of consistently and to tape measure yaggies. If you spent a little bit of money and got like an elk or an arrow antenna, you could cut that down to one, uh, one antenna for one radio. And that would be a good thing to do, possibly, if you're interested. And that is also in that uh, $1,000 shack video, by the way, that discussion. And I just like this from Andy. I just liked his comment, so I'm, I'm just going to put that up here. 
And and sometimes it is. And and I had trouble with this with some of this stuff too because you know if it was easy, if answering the question of how to keep amateur radio relevant was easy we'd all be doing it. <laughs> we'd be doing it now. I, I would just make videos that targeted just that aspect of the hobby. And I do that, you know, two times out of every three videos I posted, I would just hammer on the things that, that keep people motivated. In reality, it's a lot harder to do that. And so for you, all of you, I, I think it's going to be, you know, your involvement, your engagement, your posting online, your getting, you know, involved, you know, please, if, if you're interested in this, um, post more on the Facebook page. Po post more on the, the Hammer and Crash Course Facebook page. Ask more questions, but post your stuff you're doing in amateur radio. I would love I would love that. Uh, Michael Reynolds has a really interesting – How? where is he coming from where I'm seeing his – interesting. You've got a weird – did I – Oh, you're verified. Oh, that's why. <laughs> there is a there is a large segment of youth that are interested in volunteer opportunities. For example, in my area, volunteer fire departments have a lot of youth involved. I think the emphasis on cert areas, etc., can also attract more youth. Yes. So anything that gives like kind of a discipline, kind of a greater understanding, is good. And I'll piggyback on that because I should have made a slide on this, and that's my fault. Amateur radio solves a lot of logistics problems with stuff kids do in college and high school. Uh, longer distance comms, the ability to have a beacon that's transmitting that you can find a thing that you may have lost. Um, that is a really, really nice off-ramp into amateur radio or on-ramp. So when you're in those situations or you see somebody that's um, having a logistical struggle, you may want to say, hey, go get your technician license and We'll make an APRS uh, beacon, and you'll be you'll be good to go, because that's you know that's that's easy to do. Um, I, yeah, the emergency thing we should we, we're gonna do more videos on that emergency MCOMs uh, talking about that aspect of it because hey Frank Tank what's up howdy from Hamcation <laughs> very good. Uh, let's see what time is it yeah we got some time. Okay, so Andy's post. I'm not going to read the whole thing. Hopefully, you guys read it while it was up there. I'm doing what I do when I'm at work. Um, I'll post a lot of text sometimes, and I'm not going to read it. I'm like, I'm just going to let you read it. Go ahead. <laughs> you can do it yourself. But there is kind of a magical aspect. I'll paraphrase some of it, but or I'll, I'll mention, quote some of it. There's something about ham that's different than just calling up a friend to chat. The fact that both parties, by, virtu by virtue of being on the air are saying they are open to making new contacts is what seems to draw me in. Yeah, and I, I like the fact that we're all attempting to do it on our own. We're not helped by AT&T uh, most of the time. There are some cases where you know, you're know you connected to the internet. But uh, to get to it, you've got to be self-supported. And, and that's a major thing that, that I love about amateur radio. So. <clears throat> so I've... This this other thing that you know has to have its own its own real discussion point, but the so that's how it works. Kind of light bulb that goes off in in people's heads when they figure out, and it's not just young people; it's all ages. When you when you find you're interested in something or you want to understand how something works, and you get that kind of light bulb moment, that builds a lot of like uh, what it, it's like an operant conditioning type of thing. You, your brain re releases serotonin, and you're like. Ooh, I want to do more of this. I want to learn more. Like so setting yourself up in situations where that happens. I know this is pretty high minded. I'm not like giving you a, go do step 1, then step 2 and then you have a new ham radio operator. No, this is like encouraging people. If you end up becoming a mentor, how do you what do you do? How should you work it so that you get that kind of aha moment? I I found that to be the most the thing that drives me forward the most in amateur radio is these aha moments where I'm like, oh, that's how it works. Oh, I get it. Ah, I understand. Yes, like that kind of stuff drives me drives me forward. Kevin Fannin is texting over ham hard, and if so, why? I was texting over military radio. No, no. Kevin, no, it's not hard at all. It's not hard at all. I'm just saying that, like, <laughs> so... Your military radio required a power pack, a radio, an antenna system. It wasn't this, right? It wasn't this. 
So same thing with amateur radio. Yeah, we can text like mad. We, we got no problem sending text. You want a file, I'll send you a file. You want an email, I'll send you an email. No problem. The problem is that this is just a kind of a dumb terminal, right? When you think about it, the heavy lifting is getting done by the backbone that it connects into in the cell towers that makes this whole thing work. You have to kind of explain that to people. The, the muggles in the world who, who don't really understand what amateur radio is, you kind of have to explain to them, yeah, so it kind of works this way. Um, we're not using the, the backbone, the infrastructure, AT&T, blah, blah, blah. I am AT&T. That's my antenna. And I'm talking to, you know, whomever on the other side of the United States. That's you, you got to learn to break that down for people. I, I hate to say it. it's like, you know, what am I what am I saying? How do we keep it relevant? Well, you you've all got to join me in this task. We're all in this together. You gotta to hop on board and and you know <laughs> that's that's kind of what we gotta do. We're all in it together. So my whole thing is, you know, why do I do a lot of videos that I do? Um, I look for video topics that breed that kind of aha moment. Even when I'm when I'm surprised by something and passionate about something and goes, wow, that worked way better than I thought it would. Like that SDR play using it as a spectral analyzer. I was shocked. I was like, this is the greatest thing. I need to do a video about this. I need to do two videos about this because one begot the other. I, I figured out how to use it. And then I'm like, wait, the ARRL keeps talking about handy talkies and how bad Baofangs are. I've got a bunch of Baofangs and now I have a spectrum analyzer. Let's do it live. Let's see if the numbers stack out. What do we find out? Now, my spectrum analyzer is probably not nearly as good as theirs. But what do we find? They're generally in spec. Some there was one that wasn't, but you know, stuff like that. I I'm like, oh, I can do this myself. I know how to make this work now. It's awesome. That's right up in my wheelhouse. If it wasn't radio, I'd be doing stuff like that anyway, but it'd be something else. But radio is more fun because I'm controlling it. It's my radio. I'm sending out those waves. I'm making those contacts. Um, yeah, so my big thing is is give give people a demonstration, right? Put, put Plant that seed in their brain. And like SDRs, right? You give somebody an SDR, what are they going to do with it? Well, you could. You could say, well, you could use this as a scanner if you wanted to listen to P25 uh, trunked radio traffic, if you still have those in your area. Um, you can listen to pretty much anywhere, depending on the SWR within the RF spectrum. Uh, you could listen for number stations. You could listen. You could do digital mode deconversion. Um, you could do NOAA satellite downlinking, right, which if you follow me on Instagram, I did a live demonstration of copying a downlinked NOAA satellite image, which I'll be making a video on here as well. Um, so, you know, that kind of stuff. Post that stuff to these other people by demonstrating and showing them, and that will breed this kind of idea. This, hey, I need to find out more about this. Hey, this SDR is like 20 bucks. Here, kid. Instead of giving him a Coke, give him an SDR. <laughs> so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw this out there. Uh, Dean posted this. Josh, I'm interested in hearing more details about your opinion from the promo to this chat that MCOM perhaps is not the savior of amateur radio and the potential hams could be more interested in joining amateur radio through things like soda. Could you please expand? And expand I did. If you want to see the transcripts, they are in the link in the description. I'm not going to repost what I said. Uh, I'm going to talk about it. So uh, I'm going to say this. It's, I'm going to reply first with the words on the slide and then i'll talk a little bit more about um, mcom versus soda mcom whatever so it's possible to be prepared for communication issues without going full mcom by being an amateur radio operator and having some amount of kit um, you technically are adequately prepared for certain types of emergencies the concept that radio so further right further the concept of radio prepping doesn't mean mcom so I, I want to make that really clear. Um, the comment was MCOM being the savior of amateur radio. And I think a lot of people believe that or think that. The ARRL, right, heavily involved with MCOM. MCOM's great. I'm not taking anything away from MCOM. But I think we need to be very clear on what MCOM is and isn't or what it 
is good for and you know what it isn't good for. There are all these people in the chat that said, I'm preparedness minded. I'm getting a radio. I'm preparedness minded. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. Whatever. That's not MCOM. That's not MCOM. That's radio preparedness. Those are different things. Dustin Thomas says, Josh, thanks for featuring some of my survey results. These conversations are exactly the reason I hold the survey each year. Love what you do. That's N8RMA. Thanks, Dustin. I appreciate that. And thanks for doing what you do. I can only imagine how much fun it is to pour through all those numbers and create all those wonderful analytics and graphics. But you're doing a great job. Uh, but we will talk more with Dustin in the future. Dustin said he'd uh, hop on the show, and I'm looking forward to that. So thanks, Dustin. I appreciate your help. Uh, Kevin Duffelmeyer says, we have been working with our local scouts, having them teach us hams how to tie knots and rig antennas after they play with SDRs. And get hey, that's a pretty good. So, yeah, it's a bit of a give and take. So you, I'll show you how this uh, antenna works after you help me or show me how to uh, tie off the guy lines or something like that. Good work. So MCOM is important. Uh, things like Aries Races, they have there's a lot of fun that people have with them. The reality is, is not a lot of people are turning to races and Aries for doing what they do from an emergency sense. They're still involved with, you know, all the things that they do at the local community level. Again, I'm not taking anything away from MCOM. Don't view this as a strike against MCOM. Um, oh, Sterling. Hey, Sterling. Thanks. You didn't have to do that. Thank you. Appreciate that. Five dollars from Sterling. Ham radio isn't relevant because cell phones and the internet except except not. Shout out for hamsci.org. <laughs> right on. So go check out hamsci.org. So there there have been situations in the past where amateur radio gets used in an emergency. We talked about that on my show. We did live streams on it. And yeah, is that like MCOM? No. A lot of times it's a guy with a handy talkie calling another person with a handy talkie and says, hey, help. I need help. That's radio preparedness. That's not MCOM. MCOM is where you are kind of laced in with some kind of first responder group or series of first responder groups. So I think it has its place. I don't think it should go away. I don't want it changed. But groups like the ARRL, I'm not saying that they have a ton of their workforce focused on MCOM. I don't believe that's true. But there are obviously a chat room full of people right now that are watching this that are radio preparedness minded, which is not the same thing. So keep that in mind. So yeah, I don't know that it's the, the savior of amateur radio. I think being prepared with radios is good. I think that is interesting. I like that. You know, I, I, if you watched Ham Radio 2.0's video that we did, the, the most recent one, it was like the walking, the walking Dead in Radio Preparedness or Radio Prepping. Um, I put a challenge out there to everybody. Figure out how to power your HT. Charge your HT off of the mains. Everybody should be able to do that. If you can't, that's not good. You gotta have an ability to to be able to run your HT in a power outage, and ideally, I'd like to see you do it off of a 12 volt battery. That would be the preferred way to do it. Uh, if you have a solar panel, figure out how to make it work with a solar panel, right? That right there is going to be a huge, huge step in your radio preparedness if you can run without mains power. Right there, right, right there. So there's your homework. Yeah, you thought you'd get away without homework. This is the weekend. Uh, so I said this. <laughs> Actually, I think that was my post. Was that my post? But there, uh, there's a lot of headwind with the older crowd to these new technologies. I was at an Aries. Oh no, sorry, that's Dan. Uh, Dan's in the chat. Sorry, he was, he was, he was adding me. I understand how technology works. I was at an Aries meeting where a guy was showing off a pie based Winlink gateway he built, and nobody there grokked it at all. Felt bad for the guy. Um, by the way, big shout out to Dan on Stranger in a Strange Land uh, for using the term grok, which is always fun when that shows up in the wild. I appreciate that. So the, the takeaway here is if we go back to the slides from the beginning, 63%, I believe higher, are over the age of 55 that are in this community. They're just straight not going to understand or not care about what you're interested in. If it's something like Raspberry Pis, digital modes, some will. 
again, I'm highly generalizing here. Some will. And that's okay. It just they're not you're not they're not your tribe for digital modes. They're not your tribe for Raspberry Pis and amateur radio interfacing. And that's okay. The internet is way too big to let that any of that slow you down. Just find a space that lines up with where you're at for the people that grok the way you grok. <laughs> right? So that's what I would I would say is you know, focus on the spaces where you can get the information you're looking for. Be a uh, a grazer of information. Google what it is you're looking for. Find a community that's good at it. Use that information. Get involved if you want to, but that's why I'm saying post more stuff online, all of you, everyone, so that we will get more information out there. It will stay evergreen. It'll stay out in the community, and it will last. People will learn from it. it it's good stuff. Goose Milk. <laughs> Goose Milk. Goose Milk says... Uh, people romanticize MCOMs. Current MCOM is more about understanding procedures and working with different teams. Yeah, inter as I said, interoperability with different first responder groups. That's what it is. And and that's fine. I, that's great. I, I'm, not, I'm not disparaging that at all, but that's not being prepared with a radio. Those are two different things. And yeah, Dan, thanks. That was a good, good question. Good point. Uh, and I think this might be my last one. So... Dean said, Josh and all, I think that where we get the most traction with uh, attracting interest and retaining interest is with anything that is activity-based. Soda, tea hunts, race comms, building antennas, projects, etc. HF keeps me interested in amateur radio, especially contesting. I operate the California CUSO party yearly and have gone on several county expeditions, a sort of soda on steroids. Order over 40 groups went out on county expeditions last year. By the way, Josh, thanks for participating last year. You're in the results. That was the California CUSO party. And good work, Dean, on, on organizing that. Thank you. Thank you for doing what you're doing. Keep an amateur radio awesome. So um, I'm going to throw this out there to everybody. If you're going out to play radio, you are putting a big old lighthouse beacon on your forehead that says, come over and ask me what I'm doing. If you are doing that, please, please be a good steward of radio. I'm sure you all are, but I got to say it. Just give the energy that you you love what you do. Explain what it is you're trying to do. Take the time. And I know you want to you wanna wrap up your activation or, you know, whatever. I know. I get it. And, so, and sometimes you can't. I get that too. But if people are taking the time to come up and talk to you, that could be a potential new ham. That could be a future, you know, amateur extra mentor to some future, future ham. So just be a good steward of radio. Take the time to explain what it is and, and have fun with it. Post an Instagram video. Post more write-ups on your expedition. Take the time and just kind of go full circle with the whole thing. You'll get new people in the hobby, and you'll also be able to pull new people or, or keep the fire going of the interests of people that are already in by getting your information out there on what you've been doing. So, yeah. All right. I think that's my last slide. What do you think will keep ham radio relevant? I like that. It's kind of like a Dr. Seuss thing. So that's my last slide. Thank you very much for sticking with it, sticking with me with it. Mm. Um, I'm going to turn on the, the call light for just a brief bit of time because I really have to get on the road here. Because like I said, I'm going to be on television which I'll tell you all about when I can, but I can't right now. And I'm looking at the chats. Uh, what do you think will keep ham radio relevant? That's a question everybody in the chat, too, by the way. So if you want to answer that question, now's a good time. Cell phone plan should keep it relevant. <laughs> That's funny. Thank you, SC Flowers. I appreciate that. These YouTube videos are a good way to get the interest up. Well, yeah, this one's kind of more for those in the know. I mean, people are going to watch this and go, what is this guy talking about? I don't even know about a radio. Uh, Frank Tank, <laughs> tell us about the IC705. Man, I've done so many videos on the IC705. Man. Uh, talking to young folks, exposing them to possibilities. Yes, this is true. Uh, FT8 is currently keeping ham radio relevant. Okay, let's see the angry responses. 
Uh, it is. It is in a, in a lot of ways. I don't have that, actually, that image. I should have pulled that. I should have put that in the backup, which is what we do in the business. Uh, oh, wait. What happened to my... Am I not in the call? What happened here? Oh, there we go. If anybody tried to call in right now and didn't get in, I didn't see it. I don't know why it dropped out. KS is no more. Mike Smith, we knew that was coming because they got the K4 now. So that means K3s will come down in price most likely. Oh, my God, Rob. Got to go get ready for the work week and finish the 68-hour work week. Man. Good luck, man. Yeah, if, if you're doing FT8, consider trying a JSA call. It's a little bit more conversational if you get bored of just clicking the buttons on FT8. It can happen. In order to get a cell phone plan, people need to have tech license <laughs> since they are broadcasting. Well, see, that's the problem is they're 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 using the the – cell phone towers and the limited restricted nature of phones and the access the FTC provides through their their, le their lease that they get to to get them around it. James Hannibal, JS8 call is where it's all heading. It is and it isn't. I still like FT8 for, for getting my, seeing my signal um, as far out as I can get it. Why does nobody use APRS touch tone? I have no idea. I don't even know what that is. When can we look for the last man standing activation? Oh, uh, last man standing. So follow. So if you haven't already, please join the Facebook page. We will post the details on the Facebook page. But it is Tuesday, this coming Tuesday, which is that the 10th? Yeah. The No. The 11th. Is that right? It's in my show notes. Hold on. Let me back. 11. Uh, so February 11th at 12 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, I will be going live on WSJTX FT8 Fox and Hound mode. I will be using frequency 14.078 and 7.082. I did a video, I think it was last week or the week before, on setting up your radio for Fox and Hound mode. So go check that out. Oh, Thumper5102. Josh, off-topic question. This is a really hard question. Anytone878 or Yesu FT3DR for a first radio? Neither radio are really first radios, to be honest. Um, they're, they really have a lot of features. For me, I'd rather have the FT3DR uh, because it doesn't require as much programming knowledge as the 878 does the 878 is a great radio but it's still dmr and it still takes a lot more effort to program it than the ft3dr does all right well then we'll leave that as the the call in time it's okay that nobody called this isn't really a topic that that pulls a lot of people to call in So you'd be one of the JS8 bashers. Oh, is that the same? Oh, I don't want to use the same frequency as JS8 call. Oh, so, okay. Thank you for pointing that out. I didn't realize that um, I didn't realize that that's the same frequency. If it is, I'll sort that out, and I, I'll look it up tonight. I logged Callum on 160 meters today. Am I a real ham now? Yeah, absolutely. You get the Callum um, seal of approval for being a, a real ham. Now I'm a real ham. All right, guys, I got to get on the road here. We're going to hop over to Discord for a little bit, um, and then I got to head out. And uh, so, real quickly, my wife is standing right next to me. It's freaking me out. That's why I'm doing it. I know. So, got to say my big thank yous to the patrons that make a lot of this possible. Big thank you to Jason Brown, Jason Siebert, David Dancero, Danny Miller, Wesley Magyar, Barbara Schrock, Evan Hartman, Mike, Mark Fields, Brad Snyder. Dennis Dunderdale, Garrett Larson, AD6DM Dennis, The Wyoming Ham, Randall Hinsley, Dennis Mickelson, Michael Hunt, George Gaini, Andy, Kenny Miyamoto, Ron Thorson. The kids are like killing each other in the, in the background again. That's great. Ken Hall, Sean Bales, KJ7ITX, Ur Dragetchevich, 
Uh, Rob Zarge, Devin B. Hedge, Mark Chase, Raymond Cracker, Geraldo Kelso, Rob K8, BCR, Lee Harrell, Michael Kearney, Steve Barker, Corey Sheldon, Brad Nadow, Stephen Hunt, Connor Carroll, Michael Marusin, Mike Kearley, Harald Carpenter, The Brew Crew. I finished my brew. I'm going to just have the one because I'm going to be driving here in a second. Stephen Hunter, Justin Rao, Stephen Carduz, Richard Smith, Hercules, KC1LZR, John Flowers, Stephen Blanford, Tom Wright, Bill McCarty, Good Game Ham Radio, who I also saw in the chat, David Gerald, Mike Deards, Michael Dubay, Michael Ifreto, uh, Jace Ravenfield, Masi Madi, Daniel Sullivan, Michael Hunt, Jason Legg, and Jonathan Williams. All right, everybody. Thank you very much for watching. And like I said, I'm going to head over to Discord right now. If you haven't already done that, it's a free app. It's our chat room. It's voice and text. We'll have a quick little chat, but the topics there are always good because it covers a bunch of different ham radio topics in the chat room area. So I am Josh, KI6NAZ. Thanks for watching. Think about how to keep amateur radio relevant and post it in the comments or send me an email if you want to have a longer form discussion on it. And we can do that. Yeah, if you haven't, hit that thumbs up. 321 people watching still. Go for it. I'd appreciate it. Thank you, everybody.